piece of the state with Sharia law that was not oppressive. So, I guess this question is for the assumption that it has been oppressive. That's, that's an interesting question. That's an interesting question. I wish I knew who asked that. Um, I, I don't, I mean, um, I think that the actual question should be, has there ever been a state in history that's not oppressive? I mean, every, the state is kind of, the idea of the state is sort of by definition something that constrains the activities of people living under it in some way or another. When does that become oppressive? That is, I mean, I think that's, that's a, that's a question that can only be answered in a specific place and a specific time by specific people with their own ideas of what freedom entails, what appropriate freedom entails. So I don't, you know, I don't think that, um, I think actually the answer to the question would be the way we think about oppressive states. The, all pre-modern states, pretty much, and certainly let's say, Let's just take an example of a Muslim state. Let's take the Abbasid Caliphate in 900. If you're living in a village in, you know, let's try to take an example, a village in Western Iran in the year 900, you pretty much have actually no interaction with the state. The state, the state, the Abbasid Caliphate is not oppressive to you because you have no interaction with it, except one time a year somebody comes around and collects taxes, and that's it. And those taxes might be high, but uh, you know there's not much you can do about it. And I mean, our taxes are sometimes high in this country too, right? I mean, there's, there's so I mean, I don't. If high taxes is oppressive, then it depends. I don't, I don't think. Let's say, let's say the taxes aren't particularly high that year. I, I don't think that state is oppressive. You know, you don't have parking laws. You don't have. Uh, you can have bonfires in your backyard, you can raise chickens, there's no local codes about like in my neighborhood how you have to have one acre for every chicken you want to own. You can have chickens, you know, if there's local disputes, it's not the state who's going to just adjudicate those disputes. It's probably going to be the, you know, respected elders in the village. So I mean, I think that actually the way we think about states, modern states, modern states are almost by definition much more oppressive than pre-modern states because they actually have the technology to be Pre-modern states, you don't, you don't have enough people to go around and watch what's happening in every single field. I don't know if that answers the question. Um, the next question is for Ustad al-Bahara. How does one find their identity um, if they were raised in a very conservative Islamic setting and the Muslims in their college campus are relatively liberal? How do I stick with my values without coming off as offensive or up. <laughs> well, I mean, obviously this is a question that um, whoever asks this question, um, no, I shouldn't do that, okay, <laughs> it's too embarrassing, right? Um, we can always chat afterwards, I guess that's what I was trying to say, is that every situation is going to be different, and, you know, obviously the chaplain side of these wanting to make sure that, you know, there's there's time for therapy afterwards. Um, but, okay, so I can just tell you from my own experience, right? I was raised in a traditional Muslim home, uh, went to a private Muslim school until grade eight. Then I chose to go to a public high school because I wanted to interact with the other, so to speak. And um, for the most part, I felt like it was part, you know, organically part of the community because I was, you know, three-sporter, uh, played varsity basketball, and you know, ran track and things like that. And, um, but September 11th occurred in my senior year of high school, which, you know, I, led me to question, you know, who were the quote-unquote Taliban and, like, what does it mean to be an Islamic fundamentalist? What is a traditionalist? What, what are classical texts? You know, and that query actually started, I think, uh, partially due to um, September 11th. And so when I was studying in this in the madrasa, right, um, I was also pursuing a... Uh, undergrad degree in biochemistry because my dad's a neurosurgeon and as most of you know Indian parents are like you have to become a doctor or engineer or pharmacist right so here I was right in these two kind of what I consider like dual worlds right you have the traditional madrasa and then you have this secular campus and day in and day out I'm studying with people who 
will, you know, especially with, with the shiur, will won't even look at you, right, out of respect. Um, most of the sisters were Nepal. And then I would step outside of the madrasa into this world where the brothers and sisters of the MSA were going out and eating together on campus. And um, sitting next to Doc, Dr. Brown would be, I would probably sit, <laughs> I would probably, you know, just, prefer to sit, you know, like, that was kind of, those were the questions that I was, you know, dealing with, and it may seem mundane, right, or seem kind of like, all right, just grow out of that, right, um, but they were real to me, right, and they are real to people who come from that traditional setting, so to speak, and so my first um, kind of response to that is that, you know, don't feel um, that you are obligated to um, not, ha you know, go, go, go through that process, that, you should feel comfortable to to, uh, to acknowledge that going uh, questioning yourself and um, how you identify yourself and what you prefer in terms of your uh, safe space or your comfortable like zone, so to speak, that is um, something that you that is your right, right? You can feel that way, um, but at the same time, you have to understand that Muslims on a college campus are coming from various backgrounds and. People have a difference of opinion in how they're going to deal with, you know, other Muslims as well as not, you know, uh, friends or people of another faith. So, in in so that's the first thing I wanted to say is that recognize you don't feel that you have to uh, conform uh, right off the bat to something that you are not comfortable with, and I think that's a given, and I think you all understand that you guys are all, you know, young adults and, and are bright young people, so uh, that's a given. Um, but as far as some practical advice, I would say that, um, you know, as you're um, developing your Muslim identity in college, um, recognize that it's important to be with people that are always going to inspire you in your own your own growth, right? And sometimes that may mean that you're kind of pushing uh, the barriers a little bit, trying, you're testing the water, so to speak. Uh, but as long as you come back to an understanding that this is allowing you to uh, to really um, uh, move towards your goal, whatever it is, right? If particularly when it comes to your your own growth and your in, of your own faith identity. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that you need to start assessing that. Sorry, it's been a really long day from yesterday. I was at the airport for like seven hours, and then um, it's been a long day today. So my thoughts are kind of disjumbled right now, but. Um, I think you understand basically the point I'm trying to make is that you, you shouldn't feel like you have to conform um, to some something that you are not comfortable with and yet at the same time allow yourself to be inspired through people and be open to the different changes um, without you know judging the other so to speak Um, this is a question for Dr. Brown. Um, in Muslim states, has there been a case of Sharia law not serving the political persuasions of the rulings? For example, Saudi Arabia making Twitter haram an ancient of evil. <laughs> I mean, has, has there ever been an interest in a state in which the Sharia judges judged in a way that was against the interest of the government? Yeah, it's definitely. I mean, that was kind of a source of tension with uh, Muslim rulers historically. And uh, so, I mean, one example I'm think, I can think of is in Cairo in about, I think it was around in the early 1400s, there was a uh, couple that was caught uh, fornicating, you know, a man or woman, and they admitted they were caught and they admitted, you know, we were fornicating. I don't know if they put it that way. And they were, uh, so they were going to be stoned. And the, uh, then the man recanted his, his uh, confession. And according to these evidentiary standards I spoke about earlier, if you recant your confession, it didn't happen. It has to be dealt with as a tazir punishment. It's no longer going to be a high punishment case. And so the, the, the ruler, for some reason, was really upset about this. And he, he, he did, was going to kill the, the couple anyway. And a uh, very famous, uh, the ruler's name was al Al-Ghuri, al Al-Ghuri, <coughs> He was like the last Mamluk Sultan before the Ottoman invasion. So actually this would have been the late 1400s, before the Ottoman invasion, 1817. 
and uh, the, 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 the chief judge said, um, uh, the chief Sharia court judge said, whoever kills these people will be killed for them, deserves to be killed for them. They, if you execute these two, these two people now, you will be a murderer. And this was a major, he was actually uh, punished, the, the Sharia court judge was punished for that. Other uh, Sharia court judges, in just in that same time period, Cairo in, the, let's say, the 1400s, one a scholar ruled against building a mosque over the tomb of a certain uh, Mamluk, uh, one of the ruler's sort of close buddies. He ruled against that, and he was uh, uh, fired from his job and uh, you know, made persona non grata. And there's all sorts of other incidents. I'm just talking about Egypt in the 1400s. It's pretty regular that you had the, the, the Sharia judges coming into conflict with the state. And that's why uh, a lot of times uh, you had, uh, in the Mamluk period, in Cairo, for example, you had the uh, ruler set up four different chief judges, one from every school of law, so that he could actually kind of go fatwa shopping when he wanted something. If he didn't get it from one judge, he'd get it from another one. Um, Sister Fahad Ahmed, um, what harm do you see of MSAs co-sponsoring with LGBTQ groups? Does it mean we agree with them? What are your maybe guidelines you encourage your MSAs to follow? Okay, so first of all, for those of you who are not familiar, right? I, um, does everyone here, when I say LGBT, um, everyone's clear? Okay, so basically we're talking about the uh, the lesbian, the gay, uh, the transsexual, and bi bisexual community. Um, so the question was, what you know, what are some kind of considerations uh, to think about when you're, if and when you should work with them? Is that is that what I understood? Um, <laughs> yeah. I was just okay. So you you're clarifying. Okay. okay. So for from from my own individual. Uh, experiences on the Northwest, Northwestern campus. So Northwestern um, actually has, uh, according to our Student Resource Center, 10% uh, of our student population identifies with the LGBT community. So th that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone has a particular sexual orientation, or that they identify with the, within the sexual orientation of the LGBT community, but that they um, uh, have some connection to that community. So. For, for us, it, it's it's you know a community that's large, and um, our campus and our MSA does work with them. But here are some of the things that we lead as um, you know principles of engagement, so to speak. Uh, we've agreed that as an MSA, at least this particular MSA uh, for this uh, year, to engage with the community on issues that are beneficial for the overall campus community as well as the. You know, larger context of, of Evanston and, and beyond. So issues of environment, issues of um, uh, you know uh, creating uh, more awareness about global warming, and issues uh, that are going to bring benefit overall. Now, if um, they ask us to support an activity or programming that uh, endorses a, a particular stance on the permissibility of homosexuality. That is when we've decided that we're going to refrain from engagement in that particular programming. And what's great is that we've we've had enough conversations with the leadership of the LGBT community on campus about how we feel and why we feel the way we feel. Right. So in terms of um, what are what are the parameters that we work within? So they understand that this is not an inherent, um, you know, uh, disengagement on our part for uh, the reasons of. You know, mere reasons like oh, we just don't like gay people or something, right? This this was clarified to them that this is our stance. This is something that we um, we believe in, and this is you know we want to engage with you on issues that are uh, prevalent to both of our communities. So I would I would you know suggest a similar path that um, you know if we're working with them on uh, you know issues that are um, going to be overall beneficial to our communities. But when it comes to um, you know, asking for us to participate in a gay rights parade or a walk on campus, um, you know, we've 
actually refused in, in some cases. But the relationship is healthy enough for us to take, you know, take a step back and they understand that we're not, this is not a you know, critique of their um, sexual identity. This is a critique of what we disagree with. It's a basic disagreement, it's a fundamental disagreement. And they, have, they understand that they cannot create a double standard of that, meaning they acknowledge that we differ and that they they agree that it's okay for us to differ. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. the, this next question is for Dr. Brown. If Shadira kept changing according to the local laws, what are the limiting factors from it changing entirely? That's a very good question. I, I, didn't, it says, I didn't want to suggest that, that Shadira changes completely place to place. Uh, they're, they're what no, there's what's known as the Thawabids, Things that are fixed that don't change, and then there's the mutaghayrats, things that do change. And uh, one of the major uh, uh, principles in uh, Islamic law, certainly as it was understood from the sort of uh, 1400s until today, is that rulings change according to place and time and situation and person and, and regime. But when we talk about these rulings, we're not talking about things like alcohol being allowed. There's no situation in which alcohol is going to be allowed. Obviously, if you're dying of thirst and you need to drink, and there's only wine, you can drink it. Obviously, if you know someone has to amputate your leg because you're on a desert island, you've been injured, and there's a big bottle of whiskey that you can numb your pain with, you can drink it. Right? These are we're not talking about exception, exceptional circumstances. But there's no situation in which somehow you're going to be living in a society where it's okay to drink alcohol. Right? There's no situation in which uh, it's going to be completely allowed for people to have sex outside of marriage. These things, th these situations don't arise. So there's certain laws that don't change, but certain things do change. For example, uh, can you buy or sell something that doesn't exist? You know, the gen a general position in Islamic law is that they are Jews. You can't buy or sell something that doesn't exist yet. Um, because there's inherent risk involved. No one knows what this thing is yet. We talked talk about this a bit this morning. But in, in for example, in Maliki School of Law, if you are in a society where it's custom, it's normal in that society to buy and sell things that don't exist. Like let's say you live in America and you know you order all your shirts from Land's End or something like that. One well, of my professors used to do that. And uh, you know, I don't know if they exist yet, but let's say you know they have to go and make the shirt based on your size, you pay for it. But this is how things are done in the United States. You know that, you know what you're going to get, pretty much. And if you don't like what you get, you return it and you don't pay anything. So these kind of things are going to change from time to time, place to place. You know, what is a what is an appropriate dowry for a woman when she when she's getting married? When is the dowry paid? Is it paid uh, before the marriage? Uh, after the consummation of the marriage? Is it paid all in the in the, in the beginning, or do you pay a small amount in the beginning? And then there's an amount of the if the husband divorces the wife without cause, then he pays the rest of the dowry at the end. These are the kind of things that are going to change from uh, place to place, time to time. Um, sister uh, Ustad Ahmed, this, I'm going to combine two questions, so if you're out there and you're wondering what's happening, that's what I'm doing. Um, are there any harms to embassies um, to be more inclusive? How do we balance between being inviting but still sticking to our Muslim conservative ideals? And then another person kind of relates it personally and says that she's heard other Muslims say all Afghans are either Taliban or very loose. Um, as a Muslim, how should we deal with judgmental and prejudice within our own faith? I didn't understand about the So she said that um, another Muslim I know made a comment that either they're Taliban or very loose. So either very conservative or very, not even conservative. Unacceptable. Okay, so you're saying within the MSA setting, how open should you be to dealing with... Maybe I should separate the questions. Okay, the first one is, are there any harms to MSAs being more inclusive? How do we balance between being inviting but still sticking to our Muslim conservative ideals? And I think that's me um, addressing all Muslims from different backgrounds that have maybe a different understanding. Okay, so, I mean, obviously I don't... I don't see a harm in making sure that everyone is part of a, a part of the community. I mean, that's that's a given. I think everyone here understands that. I mean, in fact, if we if this MSA didn't really um, acknowledge that, then I don't think that this setting in itself would would exist. Um, 
so I mean, I, I don't understand if there was a very specific question to that. I see that as a given, right? Most of you understand that there's, there's benefit in making sure that people from various backgrounds come together and that everyone is in a different place, right, in their journey towards the lost Panatala and allowing for people to grow in that um, is definitely a function of the MSA, I would say. Now, there are, um, and again, you know, for example, Chicago, according to the CIOGC, which is the Council of Islamic Organizations of Greater Chicago, uh, did a survey and estimates about 400,000 Muslims in, in the Greater Chicagoland region, and the schools, depending on, you know, where you're at, are, are the MSA will really differ in terms of the culture of that um, organization. So UIC, the University of Chicago, uh, the state school, uh, is quite different from in terms of the way they interact and the way the MSA, um, in, even their programming, uh, for example. So, um, you know, the the brothers and sisters there have a very different uh, perspective on gender relations than, for example, at Northwestern or even at Loyola University, which is right by the lake. Um, one of the things that I've seen very uh, kind of this is a trend, and I, and again, there's no like stat for me to. Uh, quote because I haven't uh, done any particular case study on it, but um, one kind of trend, and I've talked to some of my colleagues about this. I mean, you know, Omar Muzaffar as well, who uh, frequently uh, goes to various campuses and, and teaches, and both informally and informally. And we were discussing some of the trends. And what's interesting is that schools where uh, there seems to be a lot of immigrant population, like first first generation, second generation Muslims, um, who have you know, a particular understanding of what is the Sharia, is, so to speak, from their own um, parents and, and what was taught in a, in a madrasa setting, um, are superimposing that into their MSA. So for example, there are MSAs where there is a parda, right? There's a, a barrier between the, uh, the brothers and the, and the sisters. And it's always there whenever they have an activity. And I'm not saying that, oh, they're doing something wrong. I'm saying that this is the reality of how they come together. And this is what the sisters actually prefer, and this is what the brothers prefer. Now, every year is different. One year, um, the Loyola MSA had a, you know, the sisters really, including my own sister, had an issue with having kind of this wall in between the men and the women. And it got so, um, <laughs> uh, I mean, it got a lot of talk and, and conversation about it to the extent where, you know, the Sun-Times actually did an article on Loyola University and the MSA and the curtain and, you know, between the brothers and sisters. And so um, the, it, the real issue was that the MSA wasn't uh, having conversations, right, uh, about what is inclusion and, you know, what, it, what does it mean when we have various understandings and people come together and, and talk about what that is, right? So with the Loyola MSA students, my sister's main issue was, and this is, she's actually quoted in the paper, she's like, you know, if I'm not against a curtain, I'm against the concept that a, a woman's voice is not being heard, period. Like, no, you know, the brothers don't want to hear what I have to say. So, um, and of course that extends into so many other aspects of MSA culture and life. So having conversations, um, I think is, is really significant within the MSA. Um, Dr. Brown? How do you explain, um, how do we explain stoning of adulterers and cutting hands of thieves to non-Muslims? Should we say that it was justice or should we deny its application entirely? Uh, right. that's, that's a good question. I, I think, um, you know, I, I, sometimes I, I get uh, confused because a lot of people in this country don't seem to have a problem you know, electrocuting people until they catch on fire. It's just, uh, cruel. there's a lot of things that we've done in the United States that I think are extremely cruel and unusual forms of punishment. Putting someone in prison for their entire life um, underground in solitary confinement in like communication management units or in terror help prison or in, in solitary confinement for 30 years, 40 years, 80 years, which is what happens regularly to Muslims in this country. I mean, I think that is um, inhuman. Uh, I, and, and by the way, these are for offenses like, you know, uh, feeding, uh, in the case of the Holy Land Foundation, 
uh, which was a charity giving money to Palestinians, the government even said that no, no money ever went to any violent ends, no money went to assist terrorist operations or anything, it all went to the orphan. Because these, you know, Chids of Cat communities which were given the money, which by the way the same as the Cat communities that the U.S. government and U.N. was giving money to, because they were somehow linked to Hamas, these people were engaged in material support for terrorism, now they're in prison for <coughs> between you know, anywhere up to 65 years in these communicate, horrendous communication management unit. Their whole lives are destroyed. Their families' lives are destroyed. Okay, People's lives are absolutely obliterated for this. I think that's uh, horrendous. And people, you know, and a lot of people in this country uh, don't think about that. They don't think about the effect of uh, our punishments. And, um, you know, I was speaking to somebody who was in uh, prison, solitary confinement for some 46 months wasn't even convicted. He was just in solitary during the trial from the time he was arrested. He was not even convicted. And at one point he was actually, he had one hour of, of time uh, a day to go outside at night into the, the courtyard, which was not even a courtyard. I mean, it was covered. But uh, the person who was shared the, the time when he was in the courtyard was actually the founder of the Crips, the, grand, the, the gang. And he talked to him and he asked him, you know, if you could have uh, your hand cut off, and this guy's in prison for life, okay? They're the head founder of the Crips. Um, if you could have your hand cut off or be in prison, which would you have?